host of CWS as it is. Welcome to another event. And those of you who are joining us for the first time, thank you very much. CWS as it is was really created, my vision is really creating a, is to create a digital village square. And I think we are never more connected than when we come together and share stories. The question I have this, after, this afternoon is, where was Guyana, where it is today, and where is it going? And our first hour of discussion is a panel made up of Kathy Yu, Stanley Ming, and Dr. David Hines. I'll take a short break and let's get started as soon as I return. All right, let's get started. Good evening again. Our panel, Kathy Hughes, Dr. David Hines, and Stanley Ming. The topic today, a modern Guyana, the importance of educating the nation for such a transformation. Let me start. For, for, from each of you, can you tell, tell us, just to orient our audience as to who you are, give us a brief description of who you are in like one sentence. Kathy, you and, you and Camera, you can go first. <laughs> I, um, uh, I suppose you would call a media professional. Worked in television, radio in Ghana. Uh huh. Stanley? Uh, I, Stanley Ming, a Guyanese in business and uh, formerly a member of parliament between 2001 and 2006. Dr. Hines? Uh, university teacher and political activist. Kathy, yes. my first question for you, can, can Guyana change for the better? Oh, definitely. I, I, I could never accept that the possibilities of change can't take place in many difficult parts of the world and least of all Guyana. So I definitely think it can change for the better. I think it's just getting the right um, series of policies, the right uh, people to run and, to, and good governance and to be able to encourage the people of Ghana to be on board with the changes that will need to take place in many, many different spheres of life in Ghana. And what about you, Stanley? What do you believe? Uh, you mean in terms of what Ghana is? Yes, can, can Ghana change for the better? Well, it will change because fortunately, the current generation, the next generation of Guyanese are very forward thinking, they are a lot more sophisticated in their thinking, unlike the older generation like myself, who we have been, I tell people, I don't have to be politically correct, we've been damaged by some of the history of Ghana, where it was for self-interest that the political parties, which still exist to some extent, uh, divided the nation along racial lines for their own self-perpetuation. Uh, but they cannot, uh, disorient the current uh, generation of younger people to think in the same way that we thought uh, because of the way we were brainwashed in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and Stanley, before I bring on Dr. Hines, while you're on, on camera, what does a modern Guyana mean to you? Well, you know, I tell people I am 63 years of age. If I have an active and uh, productive uh, 10 years ahead of me, I'll be more than appreciative. But I can live comfortably with what I have at this point in time. But what I'm concerned about more than anything else, I have four young children. Well, they're not that young anymore. The eldest is 26 and the youngest is 18. And whatever I do from now until such time that I'm done here on earth, is I would like to see that their future is a lot brighter, with more opportunity, less uh, uh, crime, uh, more security, and a more sophisticated culture than the one that I grew up in in the last 60 years. And that's what I'm working toward because I think that the best years of Ghana are ahead and the ones that are gonna make that happen are the next generation. You know, it's, 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 it's a good segue that you mentioned the youth. I'm gonna ask Dr. Hines this. Dr. Hines, and then I'll come back to you and Kathy. Dr. Hines, how, how important is the role of the youth in, in your vision for a modern Guyana? Um, please repeat the question. I didn't hear it clearly. How, how important is the role of the youth in your vision of a modern Guyana? 
Well, the youth are always important to any country, any civilization at any given period in history. Um, in the 1950s, when the independence generation was striking that important blow for freedom, um, Chedi Jagan was 35 years old in 1953. Pops Burnham was 30 years old. Iusi Kwayana was 28 years old. Martin Carter was 25 years old. They were young people, they were youth. Dr. King, when he led the Montgomery bus boycott, was a mere 26 years old. So the destiny of the world has always been in the hand of young people. And so Guyana is not any different. I think the youth are um, important to progress. Those are important to progress. Those of us who are older are there to lend wisdom and to serve as a bridge to the future. But it is the young people who are always the salt of the earth. We're always the ones who are in the presence of whatever change there is in the society and in the world. It is they who shape that change. And it is they who, in spite of what older people do, it is the young people who have always shaped the world. And Guyana is no different. Stanley mentioned just now about the what he noticed among the youth, that they are more sophisticated. They have a more sophisticated way of looking at, at their current condition and, and their plans for the future. What is it, have you noticed about the youth of Guyana today that gives you hope that this is possible, this modern, this transformation to a modern Guyana is possible? Well, my own study of history, I, I, I don't think the young people in Guyana are any different from young people anywhere in the world. Um, those of us who are moving on always think about when we were young and not understanding that when we were young is not coming back. Right? It's gone. <laughs> right? And we have to become young again, but we have to become young again through the young people. And you know, um, Selvin, in my study and participation in Guyana's politics and and, and, and cultural life. I've always seen the young people rising to the occasion. Even when old people are in the forefront making the big speeches, um, doing the strategizing, it is the young people who are always the energy. You check the crowds at the uh, uh, rallies of the APNU AFC, and you will see young faces, the faces of children. But more than that, you are not just seeing faces you are seeing young energy, and that young energy is translating into the older people. So um, you, you just have to look at the motion of the society. You see, people expect that young people will every day get up and shout, freedom, freedom. It doesn't work like that. The conditions have to be created and have to present themselves. And every time the conditions have presented themselves, in our history, young people have always stood up and say, thank you very much, we are forwarding. And if you look at what's going on here, in this moment of change, in 2015, the young people are forwarding. Kathy, what are you noticing on the campaign trail among the young people? What, what are you hearing? What are they echoing among themselves about uh, about a, a modern Guyana, or about this atmosphere of transformation that is taking place? Funny, funny enough, a lot of the um, focus groups, a lot of the youth that we have met at various locations across Guyana, at the rallies, one of the things that they are all unified against um, around is ensuring that there's an accountability. Believe it or not, most of the young people I have been in contact with are in their vision of a new Guyana, of a new kind of government, the emphasis is placed on accountability. And um, naturally, employment is a key area, but I think that issue to me was, was surprising and I was pleasantly surprised. I know earlier you were talking about the, uh, whether the, this generation was more sophisticated than previously. I think what we need to notice is that the changes in technology over the last 10, 15 years 
have impacted so drastically on the way we are able to keep informed and inform each other. And therefore the world is now a tiny little village with um, the internet, with cell phone technology. It is easy for young people to actually air their views, share their thoughts and to have a discussion without having to do it the way we had to do it 30 years ago, which was having to become part of a formal organized group, get together in rooms to have discussions. The technology allows this generation to do it differently and to have a greater impact in a wider, larger number uh, of people in a global village, so to speak. Kathy, um, well, Stanley, as a businessman and, and former parliamentarian, how do we how do we find a way to how do we find a way to move this country forward and and how do we prepare the nation to accept the idea of a modern Guyana? Uh, well, uh, well, you know, uh, Doctor David Hines will tell you the first priority for any country to move forward has to have their people educated at the highest level possible. A classic example of that is you know it's Singapore. Uh, the second thing is, is that our young people especially have to have at a very early point in life after they get the necessary education, the opportunities for good jobs. You know, and one of the sad things about Guyana, you know, you read in the papers all the time. I mean, I said recently that sugar has no future in Guyana. And what we should be gearing our people, whether it's the cane cutters or whoever else, the, ne the next generation, to get into more sophisticated uh, lines of occupation. We don't want to develop more cane cutters. I mean, that's slavery on the new masters. And what we have to generate is foreign direct investments in areas of new technology. I mean, to give you an example, there's a large operation that is being set up right now at a place called Aurora by Gala Goldfield, which is a modern mining operation using the latest in technology. To build that plant, they had to bring in over 300 Peruvians with the requisite skills to set that plant up. Now, it is very sad that we cannot provide the kind of, even if it's not 100%, at least 40, 50% of that workforce should have been Guyanese. But I know why they brought them in, because they can't find 40, 50% Guyanese that are capable of doing that work. I went there myself, and those guys are very skilled and very highly trained. Now, what is sad about it, they have to fly them from Peru, put them up here every six weeks, they have to send them back to be with their families, and they have to pay for their boarding, lodging, everything when they're in Ghana. Now, you can imagine what is the cost of providing uh, those people with the kind of support they have to have. If Guyanese had that training, they would have had jobs that are high paying. If we were to find oil in Ghana within the next couple of years, the same thing will apply. 90% of those jobs will have to be uh, filled by people who we have to bring from some other country. And that's where we have to start training our people to be able to use their skills in areas of modern uh, businesses and not cutting cane and putting it on their backs and loading plants in the future. And, and Dr. Hines, the same question for you. How do we find a way to move this country forward and, and how do we prepare the nation to accept the idea of modernization? Well, I, I think we are part of modernization. I... Um, and I think we have, been, we have been finding ways to move the country forward. I, I want to say that Guyana has been moving forward, you know. We came out of slavery, and that was moving forward. Emancipation was moving forward. We came out of colonialism. We moved into independence. We were moving colonialism. We moved into independence. We were moving forward. And we're into the post-colonial era. The point is that we have to put a new vision before the society. And we have to change our thinking about the role of government. I think one of the mistakes of um, post-colonial Caribbean society is that we have come to believe that government is the answer to all the problems of the people. And of course, governments are not the answers to the problems of the people and the problems of development. So we've got to start thinking about government as a forum for facilitating development. And 
not to answer people's problems. We have to think about government as a means of empowering ordinary people so that they can take their own place and charting their own freedom. So as we move forward, and we, we, I think we should use this moment of the upcoming elections to begin to talk not so much about moving the country forward, but about empowering our people so that they can take their rightful place. And once they begin to do that, the country will move forward. Now, politicians and governments don't move countries forward. It's ordinary people empowered with education, with optimism, with skills, and with vision. It's only then that a country begins to move forward. Now, in Guyana, we have been moving forward, but every time we take two steps forward, the politicians push us back three steps. And so what we have to, um, what we have to decide as we move into these elections is that government must not stand in the way of the empowerment of the people. Rather, government must facilitate that empowerment and to give our people the necessary space and the necessary opportunities so that they can move the country forward. Dr. Hines, you travel back and forth to Guyana. You spend a lot of time from what you told me in Guyana. And obviously you have your ear to the ground. As you move among the, 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 the ordinary citizens of Guyana, what are you hearing and, and, and how are you using your experience, your research, your knowledge and skills to empower them or articulate a, a, a new idea, uh, or, um, uh, a new idea for for how they should look at government um, to them? What I have constantly heard from people in, in, in Guyana, what I've constantly heard is a call for respect, a call for dignity mm -hmm. and freedom. Respect, dignity, and freedom. That's all they ask for. Respect, dignity, and freedom. And I think that is what motivates our people all the time. And insofar as people in Guyana have turned their backs on this recent government, is that it has disrespected the people, it has taken away the dignity of the country, and it has stood in the way of freedom. And so therefore, I think moving forward, once we restore that atmosphere of dignity and freedom and respect, then I think that we can begin to realize our potential. Now, what I do is my own little education, you know, public education, talking to people, sharing experiences, talking to them about their own experiences, and trying to help them to see that as ordinary people, we all have the key to the future and try as much as possible to say to people that all is not lost. We have had a hard time since independence. Our independence governments have not always been in step with our people. But I think that if some of us are able to inspire people to say to them that in spite of bad governance, our country is still good. I think we will be doing a good turn. Kathy, as, as you, as you um, make your rounds on the various campaign trails and so on, who do you find are listening or are coming up to you more and talking about their issues and concerns? Is it predominantly men, women? And when the women talk to you, are they concerned about uh, gen gender violence and uh, gender equality and so on? What are you hearing? Um, I would I would have to say that I get a.